Hello, welcome to By the Well podcast, produced by the community at Wall Street United Methodist Church in Jeffersonville, Indiana. We focus on clarity, compassion, and community. You will hear sermons as well as conversations about the intersections of faith and life. If you enjoy this podcast, like and share below. We ask you to stand, if you are able, for the reading of the gospel. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. (laughs) Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it was written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written of him and had been done to him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It is wonderful to begin the day with such energy, such joy, such anticipation, and and there's something else, something else lurking in the background. Friends, I'm Pastor Kathy Odinger. It's my joy to be with you this morning with this wonderful worship team to be a part of the celebration of Palm Sunday. This is the the kind of culmination of the season of Lent as we begin to move into the the, uh, the week of Holy Week. And you may remember that throughout Lent, we've been asking, what is Jesus up to? And what are we called to get up to in Christ's name? And so over the last several weeks, we've talked about storing up. We've talked about going down and coming up and moving out. We've talked about taking up. We've talked about tearing down and raising up. We've talked about lighting up. We've talked about lifting up and drawing in. And today, we sit up. Because Jesus is doing things that make people sit up and take notice. And if if in the, the days and weeks and months before of Jesus' ministry, if people had found ways to ignore him or dismiss him before, they can't now, All right? Because here he comes, riding on a donkey, or, or maybe it's a colt, people waving palms, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in full view of the gathered world. Now, this parade was not just a spontaneous celebration, but I I do think it was that, too. But this parade is also a deliberate provocation. It is an intentional embodiment of challenge to the powers of this world. New Testament scholar Marcus Borg notes that it's likely that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem would have happened at around the same time that Pontius Pilate would have entered the city in a parade of his own. Because it was Pilate's custom to make trips to Jerusalem from his palace in Caesarea Philippi. He would come into Jerusalem for Jewish festivals like the Passover Uh, Not as an act of worship, but as a display of Rome's military might. In case the Jewish people who had gathered from all over the world started getting ideas about rebellion. Rome wanted to be sure that they remembered who was in charge. So some scholars argue that that Pilate would have entered the the city from one side and headed straight into his Jerusalem fortress headquarters. And if, as other uh, Gospels claim, Jesus began from the Mount of Olives, he would have come from the other side of the city and headed straight into the temple. So here you have these two parades, right, coming at each other from different angles. It is a visual, powerful, visual challenge of the power of the empire in the face of the power of God. 
But the Palm Parade was also the embodiment of Jewish messianic hopes. Because according to the prophet Zechariah, the Mount of Olives was to be the site of the final end times battle between Israel, led by God, and the forces of this world represented by empires of all kinds throughout history. And God's victory there would then bring life to the world. Processing with palms was actually more often associated not with the festival of Passover, but with the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of three uh, Jerusalem-centered festivals, and it was at the Feast of Tabernacles that Israelites who had returned from the exile to Babylon came and celebrated as they rebuilt the temple It was during the festival of the tabernacles that there was a great Jewish revival as the word was read and people remembered who they are and how they are called to live. Hosanna itself is a quotation from the Psalms that means save us now. And it was part of the halal, a prayer of thanksgiving that is sung at these pilgrimage festivals of Passover, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. So this thanksgiving was an expression of gratitude for all that God has done for Israel. Mm. And of course, the central act for which Mm. Israel gives thanks is God's Mm. liberation of the people from slavery. Mm. So not only was this palm parade a sort of satire of Rome's military parades, it was an intentional enactment of the messianic hope that God would liberate God's people from the powers of this world and restore God's kingdom as the source of life for the world. So I think that definitely would have made people sit up and take notice. And our yearly celebration, our observation of Holy Week, calls us to sit up and take notice too. What do we see and hear and learn and experience when we sit up and really pay attention, really notice the story of Palm Sunday or the story of Christ's passion? Whether you hear it today or come back on Thursday to hear it more in depth, what makes you sit up when you hear the story of Christ's suffering, and death. What is Jesus up to? I invite you to consider that as you hear this story again. But the Reverend Ben Hensley, a United Methodist deacon, poses another provocative question. He asks, what about the sitting up expected of Jesus? He writes, I don't know if we really take stock of how much courage Jesus had when he sat upright on a colt as if it were a war horse. Courage is a gift from God. It doesn't come passively. It is a choice we make. We gulp down our fear and we step forward or sit upright and we speak. This passage reminds us that we follow one who kept his upright posture, even while committing an act that likely would contribute to his later torture and death. If Jesus didn't sit upright and boldly, I don't think those powers that be themselves would have sat up to notice. When we sit up and take notice of what Jesus is up to, we are then called to sit up and live with courage the way that Jesus lived. Or maybe a less awkward way to say it would be that we need to stand up for the way of living that Jesus embodied and that we are called to. So today, friends, you are called We are called to stand up for a way of life that looks like this. Coming alongside others with empathy instead of coming at them with judgment and condescension. We are called to sit up, to stand up for the way of living that looks like healing instead of beating those who oppose us when we call for life and wholeness. 
We're called to stand up for forgiveness instead of getting even. We are called to stand up for nonviolence instead of violence. We are called to stand up for life instead of death. We are called to stand up for life in the face of death. And we are called to continue to nourish and nurture and advocate for and work for life even unto death. So as we hear the story of what Jesus was up to in his final days before his death, as we hear the story of Christ's passion, Jesus' suffering and death, what makes you sit up and take notice? And what are you called to stand up for and live out? In the week after he entered Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna, Jesus sat up daily in the temple. He engaged in robust theological debates. He taught in parables. He warned of the challenges to come, not for him, but for his disciples. He spoke of resurrection. Every day he was in the temple in full view of the public to pro continuing to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And at some point during those days, he sat near the place where people brought their offerings to God. There were people in Jerusalem, Jerusalem from all over the world gathered to celebrate this festival of the Passover, gathered to worship God. And so Jesus watched as people from all walks of life, from near and far, gave their gifts to God in the temple. And among all these people was a poor widow who brought her offering to add to the others. Two small coins. Of all the people, Jesus drew his disciples' attention to this woman and to this offering because this poor woman had done something miraculous. She had looked at the little she had and had seen enough to give to God, to give to others. She had not fretted over what she lacked, but she honored the gifts she had. She did not operate from a position of scarcity, fearfully grasping to secure what she wanted, but rather she had operated out of a position of abundance, freely giving from the trust that she would have what she needed. What was Jesus up to? Jesus was doing what Jesus had always done, what Jesus would do to the end. Jesus was proclaiming and preparing and bringing and embodying abundant life in the community, the family, the kingdom of God. And Jesus was reminding us that all of us, even those that have little, have abundant gifts that will nourish and expand and enrich life in the community, the family, the kingdom of God. If we have the courage, the hope, the trust, and the vision to give them. Jesus and his close friends gathered for the Passover meal in a room some of the disciples had prepared. During the meal, Jesus said, one of you eating with me now will betray me. Deeply distressed, they each asked him, It's not me, is it? He answered, It's one of the twelve, the one who is eating from the same dish as me. Later, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. He took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them. They all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. They finished the meal and headed to the Mount of Olives, 
Along the way, Jesus told them that they all would falter and their faithfulness to him, but he assured them that he would still prepare the way for them after he was raised up. Peter said, even if everyone else falters, I won't. Jesus replied, I assure you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter argued passionately, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And everyone else argued that they would die before deserting Jesus too. When they got to the place called Gethsemane, Jesus asked his friends to wait for him while he prayed. He took Peter, James, and John aside with him and began to be distressed and agitated. He said to these three, my heart is breaking as if I were dying. Stay here and stay awake. He went a little farther away, threw himself on the ground, and prayed, Abba, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He returned to the three and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, couldn't you stay awake for even one hour? You need to stay awake and pray too. He left them again and prayed as passionately as he did before, even using some of the same words. And again he went back to his friends, and again they were asleep. They couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say to him. He went away to pray again, and when he came back to them sleeping yet again, he said, Will you sleep all night? You've had enough. Get up, let's go. Look, here comes my betrayer. While Jesus was still speaking to these three, Judas, who was one of the twelve, arrived with a mob carrying swords and clubs. Judas immediately greeted Jesus with a kiss. At this sign from Judas, the mob grabbed Jesus and arrested him. Jesus responded, Why have you come armed to arrest me like an outlaw? I've been teaching in the temple every day, and you didn't arrest me then. But all of his disciples deserted him, running off into the night. The mob took Jesus to the home of the high priest. Peter followed from a distance, right into the priest's courtyard. He sat there with the guards, warming himself by the fire. In the house, the high priest stood up in the middle of those gathered and asked Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, You've all heard his insult against God. What do you think? The gathered people condemned Jesus, saying he deserved to die. Some began to spit on him. Some covered his face and hit him. Then the guards took him and beat him too. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard. One of the high priest's servants saw Peter warming himself by the fire. She stared at him and said, You were with this man from Nazareth, Jesus. Peter denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. He went into the outer courtyard, and then a rooster crowed. The servant girl followed him. 
said to the bystanders, this man is one of them, and he denied it again. Soon the bystanders said to Peter, you must be one of them, because you're a Galilean too. But Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath, saying, I do not know this man you're talking about. And at that very moment, a rooster crowed a second time. Peter remembered that Jesus had told him that he would deny Jesus three times. And Peter broke down and sobbed. At daybreak, the mob bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate, a governor of the Roman Empire. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that is what you say. Many people accused Jesus of many things, and Pilate continued to question him, but Jesus gave no more answers. Now, during the Passover, it was customary for Pilate to release one of the Jewish or one Jewish prisoner held by the empire. The crowd pushed forward and asked Pilate to fulfill this custom. Pilate answered, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? But the crowd demanded that he release Barabbas, who had taken part in a murderous rebellion. Pilate rep- replied, then what do you want me to do with this king of the Jews? The crowd shouted, Crucify him! Pilate asked, why? What has he done wrong? The crowd roared, Crucify him! Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, so he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped, then handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the courtyard and called together their entire company. They dressed Jesus in a purple robe and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. They mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And again they hit him on the head with a stick. They spit on him. When they finished mocking him, they stripped off the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A man from Cyrene, Simon, who is Rufus of Alexander's father, was coming to the festival from the court or country, countryside. The soldiers grabbed him and forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha. They crucified him. While Jesus was dying on the cross, the soldiers divided up his clothes, playing games to determine who would take what. They crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself and come down from that cross. Others said, He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. Then we'll see and believe. Even those who'd been crucified with Jesus taunted him. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. Now, some women who were followers of Jesus had supported his ministry out of their own funds and with their own acts of love and service. They watched from a distance. 
as Jesus suffered and died. (coughs) Joseph, a man from Arimathea, took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped him in a cloth, laid him in a tomb, and rolled a stone against the tomb's entrance. These women were witnesses to this too. They saw and they knew where Jesus was buried. And then they went home because there were still things they needed to do and because they were still alive. And friends, continuing to live in a way that honors Jesus, honors Jesus. So as you go from this place, Whether you intend to come again on Thursday and sit with this story a little longer. Whether you go from this place and come back next Sunday to celebrate the end of the story, or maybe it's beginning. Whether you go from this place and you're not sure where you'll go next. There are things to do, and we are still alive. So continue to live in ways that honor Jesus. Bring healing. Offer forgiveness. Turn the other cheek. Nourish life. Love love with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength, love with every fiber of your being. As you go into this week, live in a way that makes the world sit up and take notice that love has drawn near in Christ's name. Amen. You have been listening to By the Well podcast from Wall Street United Methodist Church. Thank you for being part of our community. Just a reminder to visit us at wallstreetumc.org, and we invite you to like and share our podcast wherever you listen.